with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Because I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. Not just a couple of them, just not one or two, but all of my fears. When I begin to magnify God and not the problem, then he delivered me from all of my fears. Let's magnify the Lord together this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We used to sing a song years ago just like that. Then we'd sing, there's healing in the house of the Lord. There's power. There's deliverance. That's why we're excited to come to the house of the Lord. Because whatever you need, you can find it in the house or in the presence of the Lord. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Would you clap one more time and give God a voice of triumph and thanksgiving for being in the house of the Lord? Some of you weren't here last week, but you're here today. Would you clap your hands and thank God for being in the house of the Lord? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I appreciate the presence of the Lord in this house. You may be seated. What is your calling? What is your calling? You may sit here and already you have thought of two or three different things maybe that you do for the Lord, or maybe you feel like you will do for the Lord, or what you feel like is a calling from God. But I ask you this morning, what is your calling? Joseph is one of the most beloved characters in the Old Testament. He's one of my favorite. Now, I know you probably chuckle at that because every time I talk about a Bible character, I say he's one of my favorite. Somebody asked me the other day, he said, Elder, who is your favorite preacher? And I thought, and I said, well, I do have some that I connect with a little better than others. But my answer was, whoever has the word of the Lord for me at that moment, they're my favorite. And so when I read the scripture, I know that I'd say that Joseph and David and Moses and all these guys are my favorite. But really, I, 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 I mean, I like them all. In the scripture, they're all there for our learning, but there are a few that stand out. And Joseph is one of those ones that stands out to me. I also believe about Joseph that he is one of the most misunderstood in the Bible. He's also one of the greatest types of Christ that you will find in scripture. The question today is, what was the call of Joseph? By exploring what I feel was the calling of Joseph, I believe that we will find out what our calling is. And if you think you know the answer, and if your answer is Joseph's calling was the palace, the throne, to be a ruler, that was Joseph's calling. I want to challenge your theology this morning, and I want to invite you to listen to another side of the story that you may have never entertained. 
Joseph was the favored son of his father Jacob, and he was the son of his old age, and he was also the son of Rachel, his father's beloved wife. The Talmud says that he was a wise son to Jacob. It also mentions that of his facial features that it refers to the spiritual essence that so permeated from Joseph's face that you could see it. The coat of many colors that was given to him by his father was a long-sleeved embroidered tunic made of various colored strip, strips of fine wool. The tunic was a mark of leadership. After Reuben discredited himself from tampering with Jacob's bed, Jacob elevated Joseph to the status of the firstborn and made the tunic to symbolize his new position in the family. Now, as you can imagine, and if you know the story, you know that with that being said and with the dreams of Joseph that he was hated by his brethren. And the more he talked about the Lord and more he talked about the things of God and what God had called him to do and to be, it did not really endear him to their hearts. It infuriated them even more. His family didn't believe in him. They didn't take hold of the vision of God for his life. In fact, they conspired to kill him. Now, I've been hated by people. And, well, I'm going to say I don't think anybody has conspired to kill me. At least I don't know that they have. They may have. You may be here this morning, but uh, that's okay. God is my keeper. But... I don't think I've ever had anybody hate me to the point that they wanted to kill me. I've had people say that, I'm going to kill you, you know, because you pulled a prank on them. Or something. But I mean literally wanting to kill me. And his brethren wanted to kill him. And so they put him in a pit. And so they decided not to kill him, but they would sell him. Have you ever been hated by brethren? Have you ever been sold down the river by brethren? Have you ever been mistreated by so-called brethren? Didn't treat you like a brother because they were jealous or angry or didn't understand God's hand upon your life. You shouldn't be where you are, but you're there and we don't understand why and we don't like that you're there. But the hand of God is on you and they're mad, they're angry, they're upset. And they sold Joseph. He makes it to a man's house by the name of Potiphar. And everything that Joseph touched in the house prospered. So one day, Mrs. Potiphar decided she liked Joseph. And she wanted to hook up. And Joseph said, nothing doing. No, no, I cannot. And he ran out of the room and she accused him wrongfully and then Potiphar they put him in prison so here he is in the prison God I thought you had a purpose what is the calling of Joseph he had favor with the keeper of the prison and he put him in charge of the whole prison he didn't let the atmosphere or the circumstance change his attitude he inter interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker and the butler was killed and the baker was restored and then he was forgotten again Two more years in the prison. Faithful. Prospering. Prospering. And then finally Pharaoh has a dream and the baker remembered Joseph and he told Pharaoh that if you call this guy that he will uh, tell you the interpretation of the dream. I had a man tell me not long ago, Brother Schutz in Columbus, he was telling a story and he told us, he said, I went to a uh, a preacher who was a Pentecostal but he was Trinitarian and I was witnessing to him and he wanted me to uh, meet his family and so he said I went to meet his family, he had a large family, lots of sons and daughters, I think there were 12 maybe and the, the pastor the, the Trinitarian pastor looked at Brother Schutz and said well they all have questions and I want you to tell them what their question is and then I want you to answer it I was like Really? I said, what did you do? He said, I prayed under my breath in the name of Jesus. 
And he said, everyone I laid hands on, he said, God revealed to me what their question was, and I answered it. And this was Joseph's case. You're going to interpret the dream, pal, and you're going to tell me what. And this was not some small thing. This was Pharaoh. And he interpreted the dream. And the, Lord, or the scripture says that the Lord raised him up through Pharaoh to become the prime minister, if you will. He was the most influential person, had the most influential position in the whole world at that time. The financial market and the business world. Just a little side note, what are you doing? You knew I was going to jab you. Come on now. Don't sit out of the game and then criticize the game. Don't sit out on the prayer time and the, and the positioning time and the time in America and then sit back and say, well, I'm just, you know, just going to pray about it and don't do anything about it and complain about it. Hallelujah. I know we have business people here and people in the world, in the business. I understand that. But why are we not doing more in the world? What in the world are you doing? It is sometimes propagated that Joseph was a spoiled brat. And I don't buy into this because the Lord couldn't have used him the way he did if he was a spoiled brat. It is also sometimes propagated that everything Joseph encountered was preordained and that it took all of those steps to prepare him for the palace. I don't subscribe to this either. That he had to go through the pit, through Potiphar's house, through the prison to get to the palace. I don't believe that either. Now I know I may cross your theology this morning and whatever you believe, that's up to you between you and God. But I don't believe that it took all those steps to get him to the palace, to prepare him for the palace. Because I believe that he was prepared from the very beginning. I do believe, however, that everything we face in life or encounter or go through, we should make it as a learning experience and to gain wisdom. Because Genesis chapter 37 verse 13 says, Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I. Joseph responded to his father's request, and he said, I am ready. I'm sending you to your brethren. And he knew how much they hated him. And he said, I'm ready. I'm ready to do what God has called me to do. Or he wants me to perform. But what was the calling? Was the palace the real calling of Joseph? The call was not favoritism or having firstborn privileges. The call was not prospering in Potiphar's house. The, the call was not prospering in the prison. The call was not prospering in the palace professionally or economically. The call was that he was chosen by Almighty God to be used and to serve the Lord. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says that you should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. With all due respect to this sacred desk and to all the men to my right. The greatest call that I ever received was the call to be a son. It was not to carry the gospel. It was not to do what I'm doing right now and to preach the gospel. The greatest call that Brian Garrett ever received in his life was the knock on the door from the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I want you to be my son. That is the greatest calling. And that was the calling of Joseph. It wasn't what he did, but it, what, it was what he was in God. It was that he was called to serve the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. I know who I am. I know what I've done. I know where I've been. I know my sin. And I am humbled to think that the king of glory would choose to knock on my heart's door. And what's more, he knows everything about me. And he still chose me. Selah. Could it be that he also knows what I'm going to do and my failures and my mishaps in the future? Yet he still chose me. And he still chose you. If 
the king of glory who created everything that we know and we see and things we don't know and don't see. He created it all and he loved you so much that he called you to be a son, to be in fellowship with him. What will cause you or me to make it through whatever life's journey brings our way, it is the knowledge of what the call is and not to confuse it with the manifestations of the call as the call, such as preaching, teaching, witnessing, serving, gifts of help. Come on. That's not the call. That's what we do. But that is a manifestation of the call that we have of God because we are called to be sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. He wants fellowship with you, and he wants fellowship with me. And then, yes, we do things for the kingdom, but that's not necessarily the call. I know we say, I was called to preach, I was called to teach, I was called to be a missionary, I was called. And I understand that the Lord is leading us and guiding us, but the call is that we will serve the Lord. Romans 8 and 28 and 29 says, Then we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. The pit, Potiphar's house, the prison, they all work together for good to them who are the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to do what? To be saved? No, to be be predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are called to serve the Lord, but what is the good out of the all things that we encounter? I've been through some things just as you have, and I wouldn't call them good. But he works good from those things that we encounter. Being in the pit is not good. I don't care which way, I don't care how positive you are if you're a half fool type person I don't care in the pit it's not that great and if you haven't been in the pit trust me don't go there if you don't have to hallelujah it's not that great but can we have a positive attitude in the pit yes but that's what Joseph had he realized that the call was not the palace the call was to serve the Lord. And if he had to go through the pit to get to the palace, then bless God, we're going to go through the pit and we're going to serve the Lord with gladness and we're going to remain faithful and we're going to overcome and we're on our way to the palace. That is the call of God. It doesn't matter what you're in, what situation you're encountering, it's how you act and how you react that you are called of God. We're called to serve the Lord. What's the purpose of the pit then? What's the purpose of Potiphar's house? What's the purpose of the prison and even the palace? To forge faithfulness in our soul. That we may overcome. The foundation to every ministry is faithfulness. The foundation is to overcome. That's why I appreciate elderly saints. Because they have proven the word of the Lord, they've lived for God, they've been faithful, and they have overcome. And when they speak, we better listen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I appreciate new converts, and I appreciate everybody. But the elderly saints, we've got to listen to what they say. Because they've been there. They've been through some things. And they've been faithful. And they have overcome. This is the conforming to his image part. So our calling is just like Joseph's. We are called to serve the Lord. And what we do for the kingdom and what we go through serves to make us like Jesus. Revelation 2 and 3. Jesus is speaking to the seven churches. And to each one he said, if you'll read, there were different things he said to them. But to each church he said this. To him that overcometh. 
to him will I grant. And he gave different things for each church, what he would do. But he said, you must overcome. I was seeking the Lord a while back, a few weeks ago, and I was seeking the Lord about something, and I was praying, and I was really beseeching the Lord about it. And we always want a word from the Lord. But after it comes, not so much. And I was praying and I was seeking the Lord and I said, God, you know, I really need you to do this and that and I need you to move. And I, there's something really pressing me right now. And God, I need you right now. And one word came to me. Overcome. That's not what I wanted to hear. That's not what I want to experience. I wanted to be delivered from the fiery furnace. I didn't want to go through the fiery furnace. I, I, I wanted to be delivered from the lion's den. I didn't want to go through the lion's den. I don't want it because my flesh is saying, I don't like that. I don't want that. But I want to be delivered from. And the Lord says, no, you're going to be delivered through. So you must overcome. And so I did what every good believer did. I just got up and said, okay, God went on. No, I, I barely ached a little while. And couldn't understand why the Lord would have me go through these things that were sometimes man-made. And God, why are you? I don't understand this, but then I remembered Joseph's call. These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Matthew 25 Jesus' parable of the talents, and he's saying that when the Lord came back from his journey, he comes to his servants and to those who did what he asked them to do. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He did not compare them one to the other. Oh, your brother did more with his talents than you did. Or he did less than your talents. Or he, he did not compare. In fact... I believe he really wasn't concerned so much as what they did. It's that they were faithful. Oh, hallelujah. Now, you know me. I'm a goal setter, and I like going and doing, and I know most of you do too. And we, we, we got, especially men, we've got that list. I mean, we'll go down, and we'll check that off, check that off, check that off. And, man, I'm doing good today because I've got my list going on. And I understand that. Brother Tenney said one time, he said, God is more interested in building character than he is in solving problems. And I know that's not what we want to hear this morning. God's going to bring you out. And that's great. And sometimes he does. But sometimes he brings you out through. That's why faithfulness is forged into your soul. I said, I don't like that part. What did Joseph have to overcome or to be faithful when he was in the palace? Man, he made it. He was there. He was all, man, that's what God showed him. Man, he's in the palace. Everything is going good. He's got the, the upper hand. He, he's blessed. He's got money. He's got food. He's got all the accolades. He's got everything he could ever ask for in his life. He's got it made. So what, what, what could he overcome now, Elder? Well, I mean, what, what could he possibly have to overcome now? Sitting there and watching some guys walk in and ask him for help. I feel the Holy Ghost. When I needed a hand up out of the pit that you threw me in, I needed help. I needed love. I needed concern. I needed a hand up out of that pit. Where were you? And now that you're destitute and you're starving, you've come to me now. And so now Joseph has a decision to make. Will I continue the call of serving the Lord? Or will I just rest in the manifestation of the call and say, I'm in the palace now, folks. Yeah, 
and you've got to bow to me, and I'm going to make it hard on your life. No, he did not. He said, I must be faithful to the Lord. I must be faithful to his calling, and his calling was to serve the Lord. And when you serve the Lord, you cannot harbor ill will against anyone. You must forgive. Oh, hallelujah. You've got to be faithful to the call of God and not the manifestation of the call. He did what I would do, though. He did have a little fun with him. And I love that about him. I'm going to make him sweat. I won't forgive you, but I'm going I'm to hide some things in there and make you sweat on the way back. And then you're going to be scared. Yeah, I'm going to make you sweat. But finally, they come back and he runs out of the room and he couldn't refrain and he cried, I am chosen. This is so beautiful that they said, well, how, you know, how did they know it was Joseph? I've seen him for years. He looks probably like an Egyptian. He acts like him. He talks like him. In fact, he, he did it on purpose. He, he, he recognized him. He held back. How did they know it was Joseph? The scripture says he revealed himself. He revealed the scar of covenant. And they knew that Egyptians did not have the covenant. He revealed the covenant of God to them. That's why he closed the door. He sent the Egyptians out, shut the door, and revealed himself to them. Oh, hallelujah. He said the covenant is more important than my feelings. The covenant is more important. Serving the Lord is more important than my position or the palace and, 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 and getting back at you and, and having retribution against you. And, and Serving the Lord is more important. Why is the process so important to the Lord? Why does God want us to be faithful? Why do we have to be conformed to his image. Revelation 19 11 says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Why do I have to be conformed? Because the very essence of He overcame because you keep reading down and then on his vesture across here to here. The sash, king of kings and lord of lords. He overcame it all. He's not asking you to do something that's not like him. Our goal is to be like the father. Our goal is to be like Jesus. That's why we have to be faithful. That's why we have to be conformed to that image of faithfulness. Because faithfulness is the very essence of God. We are called to serve him and to be conformed to his image. And as we stand, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But here's what I want to focus on. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And when he comes on that white horse, he's coming for people that are just like him, who are serving the Lord and faithful. Oh, hallelujah. And conform to the image and overcoming. For we shall see him as he is. We shall see him as faithful and true. And that's why we have to be faithful even when no one is looking. Even when we're overlooked, faithful. The Lord
Lord told David, I saw you when you were taking care of the very last sheep. When no one was watching. No one knew. Not even your father, Jesse, knew. Not your brothers. But I saw you caring for them. Loving them. And being faithful in the field when no one was watching and no one would ever find out. But I saw, said the Lord. Pastor Anthony, a lot of you going to know I'm doing this for the church. The elders don't even care that I'm doing this for the church. What's one piece of paper on the parking lot ground? Who cares if I walk by it? But God sees. And God keeps good records. And he knows what you've done in secret and he knows how faithful you've been in prayer and in fasting and in reading the word of God he knows, he sees and he takes record of what you're doing and he will reward you it's not necessarily what I do it's who I am in God that counts sure we'll be rewarded for our, our works, that, that, that's fine that's all good and well but I want to stand before him and I want to hear him say to me, well done, thou what? Faithful. L let me interpret that. Give me, let me give you the Brian Gear interpretation. Brian, you're faithful. You just If that does not unload a ton of bricks on your shoulders right now, nothing will. That Jesus would look at you and say, Tara, you're just like me. You're faithful. Come on in. What you went through and what you did and what you endured in life, you became an overcomer and you were faithful to me. And, and now you've made it to my feet and now I can call you my son because you have taken on Oh, I know we're people of the name, and we know the name of Jesus, but do we know the name of faithfulness, of who he is, that when we stand before him, he can call me just like him and say, you're faithful. If you're here this morning and you say, I, I want to be faithful, that's my calling to serve the Lord with gladness. And it's my calling to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and to be faithful and to be an overcomer. If that's what you feel in your heart, would you make your way forward and say, God, that's me. Forget about the unfaithfulness. Forget about not overcoming. Forget about things you said or done, even last night or this morning on the way to church. Forget all that. Ask for forgiveness and say, God, but today, starting right now, I want to be faithful. I want to overcome. I want to be conformed to the image because that is the greatest calling that I will ever receive in my life is to be called by the Lord and to be called by his name, to be called faithful after I have finished this life's course. I feel the anointing of God in this place. Would you raise your hands and talk to the Lord right now? Jesus, we need your anointing. We need your help. God, we want to be faithful. We want to be called by your name. Called to be faithful. Called to be overcomers. In the name of Jesus, we know that the greatest calling that you've ever called anybody with is to be called a son or a daughter in the kingdom of God. And we are humbled this morning that you would call us, have mercy on us, and yet call us friend. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, let us be found faithful, God. Let us be called overcomers. Let us do what you've called us to do and be what you've called us to be. And that is faithful and overcoming. I need a few believers to come behind those who are here. Or would you lay your hand on your neighbor and begin to pray for them that God would forge faithfulness in their soul. Give them an overcoming spirit that we will overcome if we stay in Jesus Christ. That's it. Pray in the name. 
That's it. Pray in the name. I lay hands on my sister. I lay hands on my brother in the name of Jesus. And we ask that you would forge faithfulness in their heart and in their mind, in their spirit. God, that we would be called overcomers. That we would serve you, God, but not just serve you, but serve you with gladness. We're happy to be where we are. And what we're experiencing, we're happy. We're content in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. of the Lord. Reach for him and lay hold of him right now in his presence. Oh, 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 oh,